We hope that you enjoy this message. For additional talks, please visit abcchurch.com. Well, if you'd bow your heads and pray with me. Father, we thank you for sending Jesus, your only son, to be the light of the world. He's the light that has overcome darkness. And Lord, we want to keep you at the center of our lives. We ask that you would help us as we share this incredible message with those around us. May they see the living light within us and come to know you as well. So Lord, now as we open your words, speak to our hearts. We really want to hear from you tonight. So fill us with your peace and your joy as we study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Jim and Kathy, so much. Well, three men died on Christmas Eve, so tragic. And they were met by St. Peter at the pearly gates. Peter said to him, in honor of this holy season, you must each possess on your person something that symbolizes Christmas to get into heaven. Rather unusual. So the first man, he's fumbling around and he's looking through his pockets. And finally, he pulls out a lighter and he lights it. He flicks it and he goes, this reminds me of a candle. And Peter goes, hey, that's pretty good. You can pass through the pearly gates. Come on in. The second man, he's fumbling around in his pockets, and all of a sudden he realizes he's got a set of keys. He shooks them, and he goes, these are Christmas bells. St. Peter goes, that's pretty good. Come on in through the pearly gates. Welcome to heaven. The third man starts desperately searching. He just doesn't have anything in his pockets that would be anything close to Christmas, but he finds women's glasses. He holds them out to St. Peter. St. Peter goes, What do those represent about Christmas? The man goes, they're carols. I know. know. There's really four stages of a man's life, I've heard. There's stage one where you believe in Santa Claus. Stage two, you don't believe in Santa Claus. Stage three, you are Santa Claus. Stage four, you look like Santa Claus. (laughs) How many of you guys agree that's true? Many of you are stuck in stage three where you're buying all the presents and... Yep. Well, let me ask you something. How many of you are going to be at home for Christmas? Like you're here and you're, you're, you're at home. Maybe, how many of you are going to travel to go home for Christmas? Maybe tomorrow or this week? Anybody? Yeah? Well, some of us grew up in a wonderful, loving home as a child, and home has all these great feelings about it, like, oh, we're going to go back to the house, see mom and dad, maybe grandma and grandpa, sit in our old living room with the fire going. We're going to eat the food that we love. And then others of us, maybe it's not quite that positive. You know, it brings up some negative feelings tonight. Maybe you came from a broken home or a a home that had divorce and holidays maybe get a little awkward. You know, maybe you even had to travel between homes. and, And when you think about it, Home's not really a building or a house or an apartment. Home has a lot more to it, doesn't it? I mean, it has deep feelings. Just hearing the word home, it has emotion. Have you ever felt like, I just want to go home? One time I was standing in a waiting line at Disneyland for a ride called Star Tours, and there was this really weird thing happened. Michael Buble and Blake Shelton teamed up to sing a song called I Want to Go Home. And it's playing in the waiting line at Disneyland. And as I hear it, I'm like getting all misty. I'm like, I want to go home too. <laughs> I don't want to ride Star Tours right now. <laughs> and I think Christmas is all about going home. You can kind of see the idea of going home in Luke chapter 2 and You may have heard this read. It's even read on the Charlie Brown Christmas show. And they always read it in the King James Version, which has a little bit of these and thous in it. But I'd like for us to read this out loud. Would you read it out loud with me nice and loud? And there were in the same... Oh, that was a pathetic start. Let's try that again. (laughs) Twice as loud. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. 
and this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So, isn't it interesting that Christmas is about the Son of God taking on a human form and leaving his heavenly home? That had to have been tough. Heaven is a perfect place. And to come down to earth, has anybody here noticed that earth's not perfect? (laughs) Now listen, I just need to warn you. I have two versions of this sermon. It's only 20 minutes long if you react and respond and say amen and amen. Pastor Lee, that's good preaching right there. If you're real quiet, I I switch to the hour version. So how many want to stick with the 20 minute? Amen. There you go. Somebody already caught on. She's like, please, come on, join me. Let's do the amens. (laughs) Well, Jesus left his home in heaven. Why? Well, number one, if you're taking notes, so I can have my own home in heaven. Jesus told us about this beautiful home that we'll have in heaven. It's found in John chapter 14. These are his words to us. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. How many of you like Chip and Joanna Gaines, the home remodeling people? Oh, yeah, they're so awesome. They had a show called Fixer Upper, and, you know, Chip is a bubba, and then Joanna, she's this creative person that just comes up with these great designs, and Sandy and I even like watching the reruns of Fixer Upper, and Chip and Joanna would remodel these just ugly houses, you know, they're just trashed, and and then they always do the reveal, and oh, I love a before and after, don't you, when you see this, you know, beat up old house, and it's like, whoa, it's so beautiful, and looks amazing, and how many of you are like Sandy and I, like we, we watch the reveal, and then they walk you through the house, and we're like, I could move into that house right now, how many of you are like that, are you like, I could just move into that thing, well, guess what? Jesus is better at building you a house, a mansion, than Chip and Joanna Gates. Your mansion will be perfect for what you like. Like if you say, you know what I love in a kitchen is where there's a trash compactor. You can press on it with your foot. It slides out. You throw your trash in. You push it back in, and then you go, and it compresses it. If you want that, I bet Jesus is going to have that in your house when you get to heaven. You say, I like a gas fireplace. Boom, Jesus will have that. If you say, no, no, I want wood. I want fire. I want to hear the real crackling. I want, how many like a real fire? Like a really fire, not a gas fire. Yeah, those are getting more and more rare, aren't they? Well, Jesus will take care of that. And it says, in my father's house are many mansions. What that really means is up in heaven, which is my father's house, he's got mansions for everybody who's his, who's committed their life to Jesus. See, when you commit your life to Jesus, you get complete forgiveness for everything you've ever done wrong. Isn't that amazing? And you get a reservation for heaven when you die. I mean, that's incredible, and it's a free gift. All you have to do is say, okay, I accept. So instead of finding out that you don't have a room for you up in heaven when you die, you'll be taken to your mansion. Reminds me of a Marine. He got off for Christmas. He was, had a, uh, what do they call it, a leave to go for a Christmas break. And so he's traveling into town, small town, as he's traveling home. And all the hotels are full. He tries every hotel. They all have no vacancy signs. He goes in and checks anyway. He finally walks into this one hotel and he says, you've just got to have a room. I'm dead tired I don't care if it's a closet. I don't care if it's just a cot. I just need a place to lay down. I'm so tired. The hotel clerk at this hotel he is in, he says, well, I do have a double occupant room, and there's one Navy guy in there. But I don't know, to tell you the truth, if you would like that. He's a Navy guy. I know you're a Marine. But he said, and also, he snores really loud, so loud. The last few nights, people have complained bitterly that his snoring wakes him up. They're like two doors down from him. 
So I said, I'm not sure it'd be worth it to you. The Marine goes, no problem, I will take it. Well, off he goes. Next morning, here comes the Marine. He's walking down the stairs, and he's all bright-eyed, bushy-tailed. He's like, good morning. The manager goes, how'd you sleep? The Marine goes, never better. The manager is so impressed. He goes, so no problem with the Navy guy? The Marine goes, nope, shut him up in no time. The manager goes, how did you do that? He said, well, I went into the room. Navy guy's already sleeping on his bed, snoring away. He said, I walked right up to him in his bed. I gave him a big old kiss on the cheek, and I said, good night, beautiful. And he said, he stayed up all night watching me. <laughs> See, it's all about your attitude, right? <laughs> well, if you're following along, number two, Jesus left his home in heaven so he can make a home in my heart. When a person becomes a Christian, Jesus literally comes to live inside your heart. Sounds a little strange, but in John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our what? Home with him. Isn't that cool? The Bible says Jesus comes and lives in our heart. I heard this story of a mom who was telling her little girl that Jesus lives, you know, in your heart. And so the little girl got up close to her mom and she put her ear up against her mom's chest. And she goes, what are you doing, honey? And she goes, well, I'm listening to hear Jesus in your heart. And the mother said, oh, really? Well, what are you hearing? And she goes, mom, I think right now he's making coffee. <laughs> A lot of gurgling noises, you know. <laughs> but we have an expression in the Hispanic culture. In Spanish, people say, mi casa es su casa. What does that mean? My house is your house. Very good. And that's kind of what you're saying to Jesus. I think we should say that to Jesus tonight. Say that with me. Mi casa es su casa. Yeah. When you invite him in, now he is part owner with the home. You're co-owners. You're living in his home. He's living in your home. And you know, sometimes you might hesitate because we're afraid God's going to mess everything up. It's like, well, if I let him in, he's going to tell me stuff I can't do anymore it's going to be boring. Life's going to be all a drag. No, he's, he's going to make life better. And Jesus left his home in heaven. Third one, if you're following along, so I'll be at home in church. Ah, verse 15 of Luke chapter 2, it says, When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. The shepherds spread the good news of the birth of Jesus. And isn't it interesting? It says they ran off. They ran. They went to tell they all like had a little huddle and they're like, all right, break on 12. <laughs> and they took off and spread the news as a team. You know, churches like that, we're a team. In fact, Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. That's how strong the church is. When we all get together, Jesus said, if two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm there in the midst of them. That's like, whoa. You get two or three of you together and you just hold hand and go, Jesus, we're here. We're waiting for you. He goes, I'm there. Jesus said, if just two of you agree on something in prayer, I will do it. Wow. But you know, some people are not so keen on church. You know, have you, have you ever heard people say this? They'll go, yeah, I'm done with church. Just a bunch of hypocrites there. How many have heard people say that? It's like, just a bunch of hypocrites there. Uh, well, uh, that's true. <laughs> that's true. There are hypocrites. But it got me to thinking. I, I love going to the gym with my son. My son, Josh, he's a young adult, and he's, you know, buff, and he, he challenges me, you know, and he also watches out for me. Like, I'll go, I think I'm going to try this, and he'll be like, easy, Dad, easy killer. You know, you're going to hurt yourself. And <laughs> But he'll, he'll watch my technique. That's really helpful. And, oh, I miss working out with him because now he lives in Texas. But, uh, 
And we would go to this gym, and it was this really, uh, it was hardcore gym. It was called The Works. And it was not, you know, Planet Fitness. It wasn't foo-foo. It, there was a lot of weight. Uh, excuse me if you go to Planet Fitness. <laughs> but this was a hardcore gym. And there's dudes in there, and when they get done, they, like, drop the weights, you know, and the whole floor sh- shakes, you know. And so there was, there was this husband and wife there, and I found out later they were both police officers, but they were, they were massive. The guy's arms were like the size of my leg. You just take this, put it up here, you know, and it's like, you know, they would walk around like this, and they talk like this, too, you know, like, hey, how you doing, you know, and uh, good. <laughs> and they, you know, and they like rub their stomach, and like, you know, because they got a washboard of, you know, abs and everything, you know, and I'm like, I, I feel like, Pillsbury Doughboy next to these guys, you know, and, and so, like, it's, it's, it's so funny, you know, like, you think about, it got me to thinking, you know, like, I, I saw all kinds of different people at the gym. I, I saw some people there who were totally out of shape. Now, did that make me go, I'm not going to the gym anymore. There were some people that were out of shape there. I mean, that place is all about fitness. And there's people coming, jiggling in, you know, and it's like, wow, what are you doing here? You hypocrite. Well, maybe that's why the gym exists. It's for the jigglies (laughs) and the people. (laughs) And maybe the church exists for the same reason. The hypocrites. And the people who are really close to the Lord and have been for 40 years. It doesn't mean we approve the hypocrites, but the Lord works on us all. When we get together, he works on us all. He changes us. You go to the gym, you see people who are ripped. There's other people. They're on the extreme other end of the spectrum. Do you know what I got to wear? It would make me cry. Because I would go, you know what? Somebody who's not as fit, I give them more credit. That takes so much courage to walk in there. I know because I are one. (laughs) You walk in there and you're not that good of shape and you can't do all this stuff and you know, and you don't know how to do it and all that and your form's no good, you know, and, and, but you're in there. You're coming to the gym. And you know what this is? A spiritual gym. Church is a spiritual gym. So if you don't have a spiritual gym, we'd love for you to be here. (laughs) We'd love for you to join us at Austin Bluffs Church, which happens to be a spiritual gym. And the last one, how many say amen? Last point. Jesus left his home in heaven, number four, so I can have a home full of his light. What did the shepherds do? Luke 2, 20. It says, the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had learned and seen, which were just as they had been told. Two things I want you to notice. Shepherds in that culture at that time were the outcast. It doesn't jump off the page, but you can look in other history books. At that time, shepherds were outcasts. They couldn't even own property. They couldn't testify in court, so they couldn't be a witness in court. They had all kinds of restrictions on them. Everybody just pretty much said, go live with the sheep, stay away from us. So we're the outcasts. Isn't it cool that God decided to make the shepherds the first ones the angels told about the baby being born, the Christ child? He goes, I'm going to take the outcasts and make them the star of the show. And God's still doing that. Then some 30 years later, Jesus would be talking and he would say, I am the good shepherd. Isn't that interesting? He goes, you want to know what I'm like? I'm like the outcast, like those shepherds. Jesus always takes an outcast and welcomes them. So each of us are here for different reasons. Maybe you came to see the inside of the church, you know. It's pretty, isn't it? Give our volunteers a hand. Didn't they do a great job decorating? And Yeah, so pretty. Some of you came because maybe a friend invited you. Maybe you're here visiting family. Maybe you were drug here. You were not going to get food tonight unless you went to church. <laughs> uh, maybe you heard there's a new pastor. 
That would be me. And maybe you're like, what a disappointment. No, I'm just kidding. It doesn't matter why you think you came here. You're not here by accident. Do you know 10, 20, 30 years ago, God knew you were going to be here on December 24th, 2022 in the five o'clock service. He goes, I know they're going to be there. And I think he wanted to tell you this. I love you. Don't ever doubt it. I care about you. I didn't come to condemn you. I sent my son to save you. And he wants this to be the best Christmas you've ever had. You know, and sometimes you were raised in a Christian home or you went to church all the time when you were a kid and then you grow up and things happen and you learn stuff. You go to college. College is rough. I was in engineering school at CU. Met a few kids over here that are from CSU. And, you know, college, especially the science majors, you know what they tell you? You still believe that stupid stuff? That's just a fairy tale. You need to switch to science. And it was hard on me. I know that. I, like, people would actually laugh at me. I'd say, well, I go to church on Sunday. There was a little Lutheran church on the corner up in Boulder. And I would go to that church every Sunday. And there's kids who were like, why do you do that? That's so stupid. Well, I want you to know that life apart from Jesus doesn't turn out so good. And it's frustrating. Eventually, you run out of energy. You run out of ideas. You feel kind of empty. And you go, why do I feel this way? It's because only Jesus can fill that place in your heart that's empty. But he fills it perfectly. Or, you know, what could happen is you're a Christian, but you aren't exactly living like one. And you say, oh, there it is, the rules. No, just remember the spiritual gym. You're getting spiritually flabby. So I want to invite you today to come back home for Christmas. Let Jesus be your Savior. Listen to his voice again. Reminds me of these two boys, you know, they, they had been taught to pray and they were spending the night at their grandparents' house. And so at bedtime, they've been taught, you know, you go into bed and you kneel down at your bed and you fold your hands and you pray your prayers to the Lord. And one, the oldest brother said to the younger brother, he goes, hey, let's pray for what we want for Christmas. So the older brother goes, I'll go first. So he prays, you know, I want this and I want that and I want this. And then it was time for his younger brother to pray. And the younger boy, he prays at the top of his lungs. I pray for a new bicycle. I pray for a new Xbox. I pray for a Darth Vader action figure. His brother goes, whoa, 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 what? Why are you yelling? God can hear you. You don't have to yell. He goes, I know God can hear me, but I'm not sure Grandma can, and I think she's buying everything. <laughs> I just want you to know tonight that if you talk to God, you don't have to yell at him. He can hear you. It's so amazing. God's omnipotent. That means all-powerful. He can hear all of our prayers all at the same time. That's not a fairy tale. That's a divine being who is greater than us. So I'd just like to ask you tonight something very personal, but I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to put you on the spot or anything, but I'd just like to get you to think about it. I actually had a friend who sold real, um, life insurance, and uh, he was telling me this crazy story. He said, yeah, I had this guy that he wanted to buy life insurance, and it was a pretty big amount, so he had to go through a complete physical, and they drew his blood, and like all this stuff, you know, you have to go through if you're going to have a big life insurance policy to make sure you're healthy now, and he said, we went through all that, and he filled out the application, and here's the beneficiaries, and it was going to be his wife, and if something happened to his wife, and then it would go to the kids, and he said, he went to all this trouble, and he said, and then I'm calling him. And I'm saying, hey, you need to come back to the office and sign the policy. There's paperwork, you know, but you're all set. You just got to sign everything, and then boom, you have life insurance. And he said, Lee, he got in a car accident and was killed, and the paperwork wasn't signed. And it made me think how many people approach accepting Jesus as their Savior the same way. Like you hear about it. You go to a service and you go, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, Jesus, yeah, that Jesus thing. I should, one of these days I'll take care of that. Well, here's the thing. None of us knows how much time we have, do we? Like I've heard people say, well, I'm probably going to live to my 90s. I'm in pretty good health. You just don't know. <laughs> 
I mean, driving on Powers Boulevard will convince you, you don't know when you're going to die, right? How many agree? <laughs> and we don't know. That's not to, meant to be morbid. You're like, thanks, Lee, for this uplifting Christmas Eve message. We're all going to die on Powers Boulevard. Thank you so much. But it's true that we don't know how much time we have. So don't be like the life insurance guy who goes through everything, all the motions, all the stuff, but doesn't do the thing that clicks it in, doesn't lock it in. Because here's the thing, life, maybe you get 100 years if you're lucky, but eternity is a long time. That's like eternal, like the infinity sign. <laughs> it's a long time. It's a lot more important to settle that than to make a bunch of money in this life, to be successful in this life, to be a powerful person, to be the CEO of a large company. Yeah. You know what? When you go to heaven and Bill Gates stands next to you at the gates of heaven, you're both going to look the same. How many go, that's kind of awesome, actually. <laughs> It's not about how much money you had. It's about whether you knew Jesus. And here's the thing. All you have to do is say, I accept. So if you wouldn't mind bowing your heads for just a moment, nothing weird is going to happen. I just want to give somebody the opportunity. This is like a life insurance moment. <laughs> if you say, you know, I want forgiveness for what I've done wrong, and I want to know I'm going to heaven if something happens to me. Do you know there's no waiting room? Like, if you die, you take your last breath. You don't get ushered in a waiting room. Hey, you didn't take care of this Jesus thing, so you got 10 hours. Sit here in this room. We've got a couple videos for you to watch. Nope. You're either in heaven or you're not. You have to do it now on this side of eternity. So if you want to accept Jesus tonight, just slip up your hand. Nothing bad's going to happen. Just raise your hand. Just keep it up for a second. Just say, I want to take this step. Don't worry about what other people think. Don't worry about anything. Nothing bad's going to happen. It literally is you saying, I want to put it together tonight. I'm going to seal the deal. Just lift up your hand. Just raise your hand. I see some hands. Yes, thank you so much. Well, God saw every one of those hands. You could put them down now. And I know we have the candlelight part of the service to do. We're going to do that in just a second. So this is the most important decision of your life. I promise this won't take long. Would you all stand for just one moment, please? Just, just everybody stand if you would, please. I just want to ask you to take one more step, and this is not, nothing bad is going to happen to you. I hope you trust me. Now, I'm a big chicken. I'm the biggest chicken there ever was. So you're medium with a chicken. <laughs> if you would be so brave as to just Make your way down here. If you raise your hand, just come down here. All we're going to do is say a prayer. We're just going to say a prayer. That's it. You're going to talk to God. And you're going to say, hey, I accept. That's all we're going to do. So would you just make your way down here if you're accepting Jesus tonight? Not going to be weird. Not going to be strange. Just down here. It's Christmas Eve. We'll pray. And then after that, we're going to do a candlelight service here. If anyone wants to accept Jesus, just come on down. And if you see someone come down, or maybe someone sitting next to you and they raised your hand, their hand, maybe you say, hey, I'll go with you. It's okay if you want to do that. If we don't have anybody in this service, that's okay. We did in the last service, so, uh, but don't miss this opportunity. We're just taking out life insurance for eternity. Dear God, 
I believe Jesus died for me and that he rose from the dead and I know I need forgiveness for the things I've done wrong. So I accept your free gift. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. And when I die, accept me into heaven. So today is the day I step across the line. I am now a Christian. Help me learn more about it. Give them a big hand. Let me just God bless you guys. That's an awesome step. I'm so proud of you. Everybody behind you is so for you. They are behind you too. So God bless you. And uh, next thing we're gonna do, if you'd like to be seated at this time, we're going to do candlelight for Christmas Eve. So our ushers are going to come forward at this time. You have a candle. We're going to light them all in just a second. You know, a candle is kind of a cool thing, isn't it? We have flashlights. We have laser beams, LEDs, searchlights, light bulbs. But the light that comes from a candle is just kind of cool. Have you noticed candles are always happy? They're always dancing. The light on a candle is always dancing. That's because it says this is God's light for a dark world. So a couple quick instructions. Kids, this is for you too. This is a time to be very still. I'd like to ask everybody to stay seated for the lighting of the candles. And here's a real key component. Keep your candle away from your hair and anybody else's hair. We do have fire extinguishers ready, but the fire extinguisher experience, as we call it, is not a great one. And you don't look good for the rest of the night, okay? so. We have to blast you to put the fire out in your hair. That's, uh, that's intense. Don't do it on purpose either. So <laughs> I'm going to light the usher's candles, and then they're going to come, and they're going to light yours. And as that completes, our house lights are going to go down, and it's just going to be all candlelit. And then we're going to sing Silent Night together. Does that sound like a good plan? And then I'll come back at the end of that and say a prayer, and we'll close out the night for our Christmas Eve service. But let's really enjoy this moment. I'm going to have, after we get our candles lit, when we get to the third verse, I'm going to have you stand, and we're going to hold our lights up. Sound good? Okay.
stand at this time and let's stand and hold our candles up. Father, you know the things that are happening in our lives that cause us to feel like the darkness is closing in. So Jesus, we thank you for the light of Christmas. Whenever we feel like the darkness is getting too much, let us just pull your light in. Shine it into our hearts. Shine it into the situation. Lord, we trust you to take care of it. We're going to leave it in your hands. Jesus, thank you for making your home in our hearts this Christmas. And Father, we thank you for Christmas. We thank you for your word. Would you give us all safe travels and let us enjoy an amazing Christmas today, day tomorrow as families. We pray it in Jesus' name and everyone said, Amen. Amen. We hope you've enjoyed this message. For additional talks, please visit abcchurch.com.